Hi everyone, welcome to another video about weird and crazy tech stuff I just happened to be working on. Not long ago, while watching a video about the work of Conrad Beckman and Thomas Roth, aka Stack Smashing, about the Nintendo Game & Watch, I was reminded of the age-old question, but can it run Doom? And so, one Saturday evening, not really feeling like working on what I should be working on, I began wondering, could my favorite tiny FPGA platform, the Lattice Ice 40 Ultra Press 5K, actually run Doom in some shape or form? Well, you saw the intro, right? So you know it can. Sort of. And in this video, I'll try to explain a little bit about how that works, what can be improved, and how you can try it for yourself. Of course, I'm not the first one to think about running Doom on an FPGA and or a RISC-V soft core. Thinking about it, there was two instances that came to mind. The first one is the so-called Doom chip by Sylvain Lefebvre, where he basically started re-implementing Doom entirely in gateware. I'm not sure how much of the game logic is implemented, but at least the rendering seems to be there. The target board he used was a ULX3S using the ECP585F with some SDRAM. The second one is the work of At Ultra Embedded, where he ran Doom on a soft core on the Lambda Concept ECPIX5 board, again using an ECP585F, but this time coupled with some DDR3 memory. So in both cases, the FPGA used was the lattice ECP585F, and the resource usage hovered around the 40% mark. This means not only are they using a FPGA with fabric roughly three times faster than what we're targeting here, but they're also using about six times more FPGA resources than are available in total in the UP5K. The exact platform we will be using is the Icebreaker board by Peter Esden Temsky, aka Esden from 1bit squared, with some peripherals added as needed. Let's actually dig into that. What do we need to run Doom, and how can those requirements be fulfilled by the small FPGA at our disposal? Quick note here is that I was attempting to do this project quickly and to reuse the maximum of components that I already had, minimizing the amount of development work. So there's definitely room for improvements and I'll try to make a note of it when something is obviously suboptimal. The original README actually lists the minimum as a 386 CPU with 4 MB of RAM to just start the game, but recommends a 486 or better. Generally, it's considered that a 486 DX266 with 8 MB of RAM is pretty much what's needed to get smooth gameplay. Here we'll be using a RISC-V soft core, the VEX RISC-V to be precise, configured to support the RV32IM instruction set. From experience, I know I can get that to run at around 25 MHz on the UP5K. It's hard to exactly compare it to 486, but we can get a rough idea. The RISC-V being, well, a RISC architecture, it commonly takes multiple instructions to implement what a 486 can do in a single instruction. However, on the flip side, the 486 can often take several cycles to execute those more complex instructions, so we should at least have a fighting chance, even with the pretty large clock frequency difference. In particular, the integer multiply instruction can take anywhere from 13 to more than 40 clock cycles on a 486, while here we will be executing them in a single clock cycle. Support for single cycle multiply in the RISC-V soft core isn't cheap, resource-wise, but it is well worth it for Doom. Lots of multiplication there. Moving on to memory. The recommendation is 8 MB. The FMGA certainly doesn't have anywhere close to that internally, and the icebreaker itself doesn't offer any external RAM by default. But thankfully, some time ago, I came up with sort of a hack that can be implemented easily on that board. You can add one of those SPI PS RAM chips 
piggybacking it onto the top of the existing flash chip and just wiring it, its chip select off to another FPGA I.O. That mod will provide you with 64 megabits of RAM, which is 8 megabyte, or serendipitous. Comparing the speed of that SPIPS RAM to the 486 memory, it's actually not that bad. I'm not an expert in the 486 memory subsystem, but my understanding is that typical RAM timings would be 4333, burst access. So the first word in a burst takes 4 cycles, then 3 cycles for each subsequent word. Given a 33 MHz FSB and a 32-bit wide bus, this would give us about 44 MB per second peak transfer rate. The SPIPS RAM on the UP5K, in QPI mode, only has a 4-bit wide bus, but executes one transfer every cycle. And the controller I wrote for it runs at four times the CPU frequency. This gives us a peak burst transfer speed of 50 megabyte per second. Not too shabby. However, the latency of the SPI PS RAM is probably higher than the one of the 486 SD RAM, and even that isn't too great. So the 486 has cache memory. The QSPI controller I'm using is also not memory mapped. It doesn't appear to the CPU as one flat area of memory. It's meant to execute burst transfer commands and not random accesses. And so that's for both of these reasons that we'll need an internal cache in the FPGA. The 486, or at least the one from the time Doom was released have 8K of L1 cache in write through mode. Write back came later. And we're typically also equipped with some level 2 cache on the motherboard itself. Something like 128K would have been common as far as I understand. If you're interested in all the gory details about old CPU, I recommend checking out the CPU Galaxy YouTube channel. Lots of info there. I'll leave a link in the description. The Vex Risk 5 can include cache itself, and I configured it to have 2 kilobytes of level 1 instruction cache, but no data cache. Keeping the instruction fetch pipeline filled is critical to get as close as possible to the 1 cycle per instruction performance in the tight rendering loops. However, I'm not using the Vex data cache option because it can only use the small block RAMs of the FPGA, and those are in short supply, and that cache only supports write through mode anyway. During the first COVID lockdown of 2020, I did a few Twitch streams where I designed a cache subsystem for the UP5K specifically, making use of one of its special features, a few large single port RAMs. I will link to the stream recordings on YouTube, you can check them out if you're interested in all the details about that and the design process I used. The UP5K has 128 kilobytes of single port RAM in total, but I'm only using 64K for cache right now. We'll see why later on. Cache configuration is 4-way associative cache with 32-byte cache lines and LAU replacement policy, and is used both as a level 2 instruction cache and a level 1 data cache. Comparing the two systems, it's a bit mixed. Our SOC here has ever so slightly faster memory, but with less cache in total, but that cache is also slightly closer to the CPU. At the very least, for first approximation, it's shown that our little RISC-V system is not looking too bad. Something quite convenient with that SPIPS RAM and cache architecture is that the 128 megabits flash chip is on the same SPI bus and can be accessed and cached by the exact same hardware. Doom has all of its data packed in a single WAD file that's around 12 megabytes and fits easily in the 60 megabyte flash we have at our disposal. It can simply be placed there and accessed as memory mapped file. All the executable code and read-only data can also be in flash and accessed, executed in place. All of this is enough to run the Doom code, but obviously we need something to display the result. Otherwise, we'll be using a DVI-P mod from 1bit square that plugs into the Icebreaker double P mod slots and contain a DVI encoder chip. You send the pixel and sync information at the pixel clock rate on a parallel bus, and it generates a corresponding DVI signal. Note that it's DVI and not HDMI because of licensing, but DVI video signal is electrically and logically compatible with HDMI, and the P mod actually has an HDMI connector. It allows us to output 12 bit per pixel color information. There is a 24 bit version of that P mod, basically using 12 bit DDR bus. But for one, I haven't worked with it, and second, it's not generally available yet, so I went with what people were most likely to have. The original Doom made use of the VGA mode 13H. It's a 320 by 200 graphical mode with a 256 color palette out of 262,000 possible color, 18 bits. One of the peculiarities about that mode is that the pixels aren't square. The 320 by 200 ratio is 16 by 10, but it was displayed full screen on the 4 by 3 CRT of monitors of the time, and so the pixel was stretched vertically by about 20%. Exact video timing are not always easy to find. There isn't one authoritative standard that I could find, so all the values you find online are slightly different. But this is what I went with. The VGA mode only has 200 distinct lines, but they are internally doubled to 400. And the number of X pixel is listed here. 640, but in VGA, being analog, there isn't really a fixed number of pixels from the video timings point of view. It's just a time duration during which a line is drawn, and what matters is how many distinct value could the hardware draw during that time. And for mode 13H, that is 320 pixels. So here, over HDMI, we will be outputting 640 by 400 pixels at 70Hz, and simply
complete doubling pixels both horizontally and vertically. And you'll note that the pixel clock is 25.175 MHz, which is very close to the 25 MHz I mentioned earlier as the CPU frequency for the VEX. Oh, convenient. We can't generate 25.175 MHz exactly, but 25.125 MHz is close enough, and that's what we will be using, both as the pixel clock and the system frequency, keeping everything synchronous. My PC monitor handles that mode pretty well, displaying it even with the correct aspect ratio, as far as I can tell. My TV, however, and my three HDMI capture cards don't really like it very much. It might have been standard in the DOS days, but nowadays not so much. Although it's still supposed to be the same timings as the default DOS text mode, so anyway, try and make things more compatible. I added provision to output a more standard 640 by 480 at 60 hertz mode. It's not ideal because for once some scaling is needed, and since there isn't a lot of resource to spare in the FPGA, it is rather crude. Simply tripling some lines instead of doubling them to stretch things vertically to the correct ratio, and also because the Doom internal tick rate, the time passing in the game, if you will, is based on the vertical refresh rate. So at 60 hertz, time-based events, speed of movements, and such are slowed down a bit. On the gateway side, I didn't have any pre-written core I could directly use, so I had to code one. As mentioned earlier, I went for the easy solution. 320 by 200 resolution in 256 colors needs 64,000 bytes for a flat frame buffer, which fits nicely into the other 64 kilobyte half of the UP5K single port RAM. Disconnected to a bit of time sharing logic that allows it to be read and written from the wishbone peripheral bus by the CPU, and also read by the video logic. During the active video period, once every 8 cycles, 32 bits, so 4 pixels, are pulled from the frame buffer and sent one after the other to the palette lookup to get the final color bit. Those are then sent off to the PMOD pins for the DVI color chip. Pretty simple video pipeline. To avoid flickering, Doom does all the drawing in an off-screen buffer in the main RAM and then does a mem copy from that buffer to the final frame buffer. That's also how the original Doom worked as far as I understand, since VG hardware didn't offer any kind of hardware-based double buffer, at least for this mode. It's obviously not ideal. First, we waste time doing a mem copy, and here we also use half of the UP5K SP RAM as a frame buffer instead of having it available as additional cache for the CPU. A better design would have been to only have a line buffer using small block RAMs and preload it via DMA during the horizontal blank and then draw from it during the active area. Implementing double buffer in this case doesn't require any mem copy from the CPU. You just need to update the DMA base address at each frame, flipping between two buffers in the main memory. The logic to implement this is rather simple, and I actually already have something very similar in the memory test example I wrote for the SPI controller core. The complexity comes from the cache. Since it is right back and the DMA bypasses it, before flipping buffer, you need to make sure that any dirty cache lines are written back to the main memory, and this is currently not supported. I'm still thinking about the best way to add this function. That's why I went for the simpler approach of using half the SPRM as frame buffer for the time being. Finally, in our list of requirements is user input. Player needs a way to interact with the game. We still have one free PMOD slot, so the obvious choice would be something like the gamepad interface PMOD that allows you to connect NAS or Super NES gamepads to the icebreaker. And I totally didn't do that. Even though I have one of those, what I don't have is any controller to plug into it. So when I was working on this project, I wanted it done right now. So I went with something I could do with what I had on hand. The solution I'm using is to feed user input through the serial port provided by the FTDI from the host machine. At first, it was rather crude, just feeding character with a terminal emulator, Minicom. It's really not good, though, because for gaming, you really want to send key down and keyed up events to support key being held down for some time and multiple of them at the same time. So I quickly switched to having a Python program on my laptop, making use of the Pygame library to capture user input, both keyboard and mouse, encode it into a serial stream, and send it off to the RISC-V core so it could feed the event loop of the game logic. That's it for the hardware gateway side of things. This is what the final logic in the FPGA looks like. The ICE40 project can be found in my ICE40-playground repository on GitHub under the project slash RISC-V underscore doom directory. There was really not that much new logic needed to bring this up. Only seven files in the RTL subdirectory containing the gateway specific to that project. SOC VRAM.V, VITFRAMEBUFF.V, VITPALET.V are all trivial thin wrappers for the FPGA specific memory blocks for the boot ROM, video frame buffer, and color palette memory respectively. VEX risk 5v is the auto-generated Verilog out of the Spinal HDL generator for our VEX configuration. SysMGA.V contains the clock and reset generation logic. Because we run the memory at 4 times the clock rate, there are some tricks in there, but most of it is provided by pre-existing helpers that come with the memory controller. Let's have a closer look at the two really unique files written for this project. First one is vittop.v and contains the video logic. Definition of the ports, not much to see there, just the video output that will go to the PMOD and a wishbone interface with the CPU. 
then declaring all the signals, then instantiating the two main memory blocks, one for the frame buffer, one for the color palette memory. They are both implemented using IS40 primitives, but dropped into some modules to make things look neater. The frame buffer wrapper also contains the sharing logic to mux access between the video pipeline and the wishbone bus. Then comes the timing generator, a block I wrote previously that can be configured to generate any video timing and gives useful sideband signals like first and last column, first and last line, things like that. Then we have a couple of status and frame counter. Those are exposed as registers to the CPU so it can know when the vertical refreshes and also how many frames have been drawn. This is used to generate the internal time, internal tick rate of the game engine. Then the main video pipeline. That's how pixels go from the frame buffer to the screen. First step is addressing and generating the address where to fetch pixels from and doubling, tripling lines and or column as needed. This is fed into the frame buffer memory read port and generates a fetch of 4 pixels every 8 cycles. Those 4 pixels are loaded into a shift register and shifted out one by one. The 8 pixel color index value is used as address to the color palette read port to fetch the final RGB value and that's what's fed into the HDMI 51 x module. That last module is again just a wrapper for HBIO IS40 primitives that take care of instantiating IO registers to make sure that all the setup and all time requirements of the encoder chips are met. And then finally the bus interface. This is what allows the CPU to read and write from the frame buffer memory, write the palette memory, and read the few status information that we have. As you can see, it's all pretty simple. Very little logic there. Moving on to top.v, which is the top level of the design, gluing everything together. Again, for definition, not much there. Mostly just the SPI bus, the video output, the UART connected to the FTDI. Lots of definition for all the internal signals, not very interesting. Ah, the CPU instance. Its main interface are the instruction bus and the data bus. For the former, I used an AXI bus to allow for fast burst transfers from the L2 cache to the L1 cache internal to the VAX. For the data bus, simple wishbone, non-pipeline variant. Then we find the MC bus VAX blocks. This could be described a bit like the North Bridge. It's mainly glued logic that will route access from the CPU to where they need to go. Either to the cache memory for the PS RAM and the flash access, to the boot ROM for the lower 1K region, or to the peripheral wishbone bus. And it has distinct bus interface for all those zones. Then comes the boot ROM. This is just a 1 kilobyte zone of block RAM required for booting. At initialization, the SPI controller and the flash PS RAM are not ready. They need some initialization, so that ROM contains the tiny bit of code that will prepare all that's needed for flash and RAM access to work, and then jump to the real start of the code in flash. Of course, we get to the cache controller itself, which takes requests and sends response to the bridge, and also connects through the memory interface to the SPI controller and its file, which comes right after it. You can also see a memsim block. This is just for simulation to avoid to simulate the whole SPI thing if this is not needed. And we then get to the peripheral. The video block I explained earlier, a UART to receive input commands from the host and also send debug output, and a GB LED controller just because, you know, blinkies. Finally, at the very bottom, the clock and reset generation. All done in the sysmgrv file, except for simulation, where instead I generate signals manually because the open tools don't currently provide a working simulation model for the ice 40 PLO. If we take a look at the build report from NextPNR, we can see that even with all of this, there is definitely still room for a bit of expansion. Timing-wise, it's not trivial to find a seed that fully meets the 25.125 MHz timing constraint given the very pessimistic timing analysis from NextPNR. However, it's pretty easy to find one meeting 23 MHz constraint, and that's less than 10% off. Given in typical condition, the timings are almost 50% faster than NextPNR's model, I don't have any issues relying on this. Moving on to the software part of things. The port I made can be found on my GitHub in the Doom Risk 5 repository, link in the description as usual. This is not the original port I did during my first test, but rather a redo where I split things into nice commits to try and make it more understandable and to help people that would like to adapt it to their own platform. To get a rough idea of where to start, what I did is take the port made by Ultra Embedded for the CB5 platform, diff that against the original Doom source code, and see what part it changed so that I could get a, an idea of how to adapt it to my SOC. I started off clean from the GPL Doom source code release, first doing a bit of cleanup work to get it building without warning for the Linux X11 platform. The code isn't very new and some things it did were not very best practice, shall we say, and it even contained a couple of bugs. Then for the actual port. All the source files in the Doom prefixed by I underscore are system specific things and so need to be re-implemented from scratch. Nothing very complicated, mostly just frame buffer handling, input handling, and sound network things. Those last two are currently just 
stubbed out since there is no sound, music, or network support here. Next step is to provide a libc backend implementation. Source code of Doom makes use of standard POSIX function for things like file access, among others. And although the RISC-5 toolchain I use contains new lib, you still need to provide a backend for it, so it knows how to load files and that kind of stuff. The implementation I provided can be found in libcbackend.c and it's really simple since pretty much all Doom needs is a way for printf to work and to load one single file, the big what file with all of its data. Finally, you find a make file, startup.s startup code, and the linker script. All pretty common stuff for embedded bare metal programming, nothing special here. This is all technically enough to get it through run. However, I did a few more tweaks to help things run smoother. The first is to disable a bit more of the sound code. Even with a stopped out i underscore sound.c, some sound processing remained and removing that could help both reduce the code size and speed things up a bit. The second was to provide an optimized dmain.c, which is sort of the do main function. By default, it tries to detect which version of the game is running, you know, shareware, commercial, Doom 2, Doom Ultimate, that kind of stuff. And a lot of it can be removed here. And finally, I did some code tweaks here and there, specific to the Risk 5. For instance, some places incorrectly assumed signed car type, which is just case on x86, but on Risk 5, car are unsigned by default. And this caused some bugs where you couldn't move backward or straight left. Another example was some places in the code where Doom was using lookup tables to avoid some multiplication, which might make sense given the slow multiplication on the 486, but here we can execute multiply faster than table lookups, so I just removed that. This was really just a few quick tweaks. I'm sure there are quite a few ways to speed it up just on the software side. The original DOS version was using assembly optimized drawing routine. Here is just a generic C version. I've also noticed that different builds sometimes show more performance difference than one might expect, so I suspect that cache line alignment of some piece of data or some piece of code plays a big role. Lots of things to look into if you're interested. Okay, I think that pretty much covers it. All sources are published, see links in the description, and you can see the result now, captured directly off the video output. And yes, I know, I'm not very good at doing. Background music is obviously overlaid through the magic of editing, but adding a MIDI output to play the original music with the help of an external MIDI synthesizer would probably be pretty easy and I might have a go at it. It just so happens that the music was written for the Roland SC55 and that's exactly what I have here. Anyway, lots of possible improvements. And if you want to try your hands at some of them, don't hesitate to contact me. For these i 40 projects, the best platform is probably the one bit Square Discord or the OpenFPGA IC channel on Freenode. I hope you found this video interesting and entertaining. It sure took a while to make, probably longer than the actual project it described, so I'd really appreciate a like if you liked it. For the rest, you know the drill. Subscribe if you want to see future video. Do not click the bell icon because seriously, what I post is really not time sensitive. Why would you want notifications for that? And if you have any question or remark and can't be bothered to use Discord or IRC, well, I guess you have the comment section. If you're still listening, kudos and see you in the next one.